Welcome to the Johns Hopkins Women's Health Podcast, A Woman's Journey, Insights That Matter. I'm Kelly Gear Ripkin, and I invite you to listen to Johns Hopkins specialists discuss the latest topics in women's health. Now here's your host, Lily Shockney. Hi, this is Lily Shockney from A Woman's Journey at Johns Hopkins, and this is our podcast, Insights That Matter. Today, we are joined by preventive cardiologist Aaron Mikos, Associate Professor of Medicine and Associate Director of Prevention Cardiology at the Chickaroni Center for the Prevention of Cardiovascular Disease at Johns Hopkins. Dr. Mikos, heart disease remains the number one cause of death for women in the United States. So let's start with discussing risk factors for women cardiovascular prevention methods, if there are some. And finally, let's discuss the 2019 Primary Prevention Cardiovascular Guidelines and topics such as vitamin D, daily aspirin to prevent heart attack and hormone replacement therapy, as well as statin therapy. Let's go ahead and start right now um, at at the beginning uh, with taking a look at the uh, 2019 Primary Prevention Guidelines. Yes, well, thank you for having me here today, because as you said, cardiovascular disease remains the number one cause of death of women in the United States and worldwide. About 400,000 women die each year in the United States from cardiovascular disease. And although we've made tremendous progress in declining heart disease deaths for the past few decades, there's some alarming data that this is plateauing and slowing down. And even some data that heart attack rates in younger women are actually on the rise. And this is largely due to increases in risk factors such as diabetes and high blood pressure that we have in a modern society. So can you define younger women? Yeah, so unfortunately, heart disease is on the rise in women under the age of 50, that a lot of progress has made, still not perfect, as we'll talk about, there still remains disparities, but a lot of progress has been made in improving outcomes in older women. But younger women, probably because of their younger age, it's maybe not thought that heart disease might affect them. And I think that they're sort of undertreated for screening for risk factors, and they may not recognize symptoms that they're having as as being possibly due to heart disease because they and their doctors might be thinking that that they're too young to have this. So young women can have heart disease, and unfortunately, that is on the rise in younger women. But overall, cardiovascular disease is making progress, so a lot of it is largely preventable, which is why I'm excited to be a preventive cardiologist. So you mentioned risk factors. So there are what we call traditional risk factors that affect both men and women, and these include things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, smoking, being overweight, being sedentary, having a family history of early heart disease. Those are uh, risk factors for both men and women, but there are some differences. For example, diabetes and smoking are stronger risk factors in women, that they're even worse for women than they are in men for uh, promoting heart disease. And on top of that, There are risk factors unique to women that men don't experience related to hormones, menopause, pregnancy. We know that women who have had early menopause before the age of 45 are at greater risk for heart disease. Women who've had an abnormal pregnancy with like high blood pressure or diabetes in pregnancy or preeclampsia. We know that even decades after that pregnancy, they remain at increased risk for heart attacks and strokes. But many doctors don't ask women about these pregnancy factors that are risk-enhancing factors. And additionally, women with a history of breast cancer uh, who've survived their cancer may be at risk for cardiovascular disease too. And so those are risk factors unique to women that I think uh, a lot of doctors are not asking their patients about or realizing their contributions of those factors to heart disease. And so for, for the breast cancer patient population, is this due to having to, we want to deplete their estrogen and progesterone down to nothing if we possibly can, uh, or is it due to some of the chemotherapy agents that have cardiotoxic effects, or is it a combination of both? Yeah, so it's a combination. There are some risk factors that cancer and cardiovascular disease oh, have some overlap. For example, being smoking, high-fat diets, being sedentary, they can be risk factors for both cancer and heart disease. But on top of that, some of the therapies women get for breast cancer, chemotherapies, can have direct cardiac toxicity that we need to monitor the heart function. 
And additionally, women who may have gotten radiation to their left breast, the heart sits on the left side and may be in the field of radiation, they, they may also have some complications for that. So there is a lot of overlap and the loss of uh, estrogen early as part of the treatment in many of the, the women who have a uh, estrogen sensitive breast cancer and are on therapies to block estrogen, that places them at increased cardiovascular risk. Now you mentioned smoking and I feel like we have to define find smoking maybe differently than the way we used to. Does this also include e-cigarettes and vaping? First of all, about half of all coronary or heart attack vents in women are, are due to smoking. So this remains one of the most leading preventable causes of heart disease. So uh, all smoking is bad. And there's some you know, data that some smokings have been on, on the rise in young women. Now, there's a, some, a lot of controversy about e-cigarettes. They may be safer than traditional cigarettes, but they're not safe. And so we need longer term outcomes. But what's really alarming is that even though these are designed for tobacco cessation to wean people off traditional cigarettes, there are many younger adults, teenagers, young adults who were never smokers and are actually taking up e-cigarettes. And now we're having a whole new generation that's becoming addicted to nicotine. And yes. nicotine has cardiovascular effects and, and raising blood pressure and heart rate. And so there's cardiac risk with just nicotine, not, not even just the smoke. And plus there's lots of chemicals in these e-cigarettes and they really vary across vendors and products and none of it is good and uh, I wouldn't consider any of it a safe. Let's talk a little bit more. You mentioned uh, vitamin D. What is its relationship Vitamin D, uh, one needs to have adequate levels of that for bone health. And there hadn't remained a lot of controversy about whether the importance of vitamin D for heart health. So we know in population studies, observational studies, that individuals who have low blood levels of vitamin D, including women, are at greater risk for heart attack, stroke, heart failure, all these bad things. And that's when a lot of my research have shown this association. But associations don't always mean a direct cause and effect. And you know, the big question for what we had was, well, if someone is deficient and we give them vitamin D in a supplement, whether we can prevent a heart attack. And unfortunately, the data to date has shown that that's not the case. There was a very large clinical trial, 25,000 people called the VITAL trial. It was published in November in the New England Journal of Medicine. And these were individuals without heart disease or cancer. And giving vitamin D supplements at 2,000 international units a day compared to placebo, unfortunately, did not reduce the rates of heart attacks or strokes. And so the, probably the discordance is, is that low blood levels of vitamin D just might be a marker of someone who's in poor health. We know that people who have increased body fat have lower levels because fat cells sequester vitamin D. We get most of our vitamin D from sunlight. So people with low levels are people who are not doing you know, healthy outdoor physical activity. So it may be that low vitamin D levels are a marker of risk, but not something that is a direct cause of heart disease risk. So at this point in time, there is no strong evidence for people to take vitamin D for the sole purpose of preventing cardiovascular disease. And I would argue that if someone actually has sufficient levels, normal blood levels, taking more vitamin D you know, may not help and actually in high doses can be harmful. So people shouldn't just take supplements for no reason. Most of the nutrition that you need from a healthy diet, in the case of vitamin D, getting some modest sunlight exposure, maybe all that you need for many women. Now, when a patient goes to see their PCP and they get routine blood work done, oftentimes a vitamin D3 level isn't in the panel of the blood tests that will be performed. Do you recommend that a patient bring this up to her primary care provider and ask about getting that checked annually? No, there is no indication that adults should routinely get their vitamin D levels measured. The only ones that we would screen for are individuals where there is some concern for a deficiency related to a bone disorder, osteoporosis, where there'd be increased risk. Because again, as I mentioned, so far to date, there's been not any evidence that giving vitamin D supplements you know, it doesn't seem to reduce heart disease risk. It doesn't actually seem to reduce 
falls. Even the fracture data is pretty weak. In ambulatory adults who are not in a nursing home, the evidence is even pretty weak that giving vitamin D supplements can even reduce fractures. The Women's Health Initiative study did not find that Hmm. vitamin D supplements reduce fractures. So there's not a strong indication to measure this routinely. In fact, I think people are being over-tested and over-treated. But in individuals where there's a concern for a bone disorder, yes. And the blood test is called a 25-hydroxy D test is the blood test you would check to determine one's sufficiency status. If any of our listeners are on Jeopardy tonight, they'll have the answer to that question. (laughs) (laughs) Mental stress and depression. Can you talk a bit about that? Because that is a real concern to many women. When I look back at my grandparents two generations ago for me, both of my grandmothers were home. They were housewives. It was my grandfathers that were out working and dealing with the stress of bringing in enough money, etc. But now usually both spouses are working and women are not unusually in a uh, very stressful job as well. And they're worrying about money and worrying about kids, etc. So uh, stress as well as depression Can you talk a bit about Mm -hmm. if they have a correlation as a risk factor? Yeah, absolutely. So stress and and psychosocial stress definitely has, you know, cardiovascular effects. It increases your heart rate, your blood pressure, maybe your cortisol, your hormone levels. It, It may affect your sleep, increases inflammation. So it definitely can confer some cardiovascular risk. And data have shown that individuals who have increased levels of stress have worse outcomes. For example, women who've been through a divorce, divorce is a a much stronger risk factor in women than in men. It seems that women's hearts are more impacted by the effects of stress. In fact, there's even a disorder called a stress cardiomyopathy from a s- severe acute psychological stress. And this uh, happens uh, almost exclusively in, in women. 80% of the cases are postmenopausal women. So women's, because of maybe the hormone effect, the adrenaline, the catecholamine effect of stress, they may have a more robust response to this that affects the cardiovascular system. And furthermore, I don't think that us as clinicians are doing a very good job of uh, broadly of screening for psychosocial uh, factors among heart disease patients. Women are more likely to be rehospitalized after a heart attack. And this is not all explained by traditional risk factors. And it's thought that depression after a heart attack is increases the risk of being rehospitalized or having uh-huh. an adverse outcome and being less likely to participate in cardiac rehab and, and taking preventive therapies. And I think that uh, doctors are so focused on treating the heart attack that they may forget to treat the whole person yes. and address some of these psychosocial stressors. Yeah, we, we definitely want to make sure that we're delivering patient-centered care, that her situation is far beyond just her heart organ. And we do need to look at underlying causes of her risk. And this isn't always just, we're not always talking about medications. I mean, a lot of depression and depressive symptoms can be treated with a good therapy relationship and other lifestyle modifications and other coping mechanisms. So I'm not always talking about just giving more drugs Mm -hmm. to treat this. And it's important, we can't mitigate, uh, reduce all stress in life. I mean, some stress is normal and adaptable. I mean, a a healthy amount of stress is what gets us motivated to meet deadlines and get things done. And we need a little bit of stress to meet expectations. But when it becomes pathological, and so I really encourage women to try to find coping mechanisms and seek help and don't be afraid to ask for help and to be ashamed about talking about this. One in five women you know, we have depressive symptoms mm-hmm. and coping mechanisms may vary among individuals. Exercise is, is a good mood booster. Certainly having a strong social network and support can really help, especially in difficult times. Yes, it isn't so much that the individuals had some, let's say, life crisis. It's how she has reacted to that life crisis right. 
that yeah, there's uh, is going to really very much influence this. Yeah, there's this really interesting work about resilience mm-hmm. um, and that different people might have the same stressor but respond to it differently. And really interesting data about having a sense of purpose and optimism. So individuals who are more likely to score higher on indicating that they feel like they have a sense of purpose and more optimistic, they actually have better long-term outcomes and probably because they have more coping me- mechanisms, a-, a way of dealing with when stress, uh, which everybody has stress in their life. Right. Well, we all need to feel a sense and know what our purpose is, but sometimes people need help in recognizing what it is. Mm-hmm. And I think that uh, psychotherapy can help women in being able to better look within themselves and identify how do I want to make a difference? And then perhaps learn, gee, I am already making a difference. I've just never really looked at it that way or acknowledged it in that way. Also, rheumatologic diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis or or lupus, yeah. how does that play a part in this? Many rheumatologic disorders such as lupus and rheumatoid arthritis are much more prevalent, much more common in women than men. So they're not women exclusive, but they affect women much more. And we have shown that these individuals with autoimmune disease are at much greater risk of heart attacks and strokes atherosclerosis, which is the buildup in plaque in in the arteries in the body, including the heart arteries and the arteries that supply blood to the brain, is often fueled or propagated by inflammation. So there becomes uh, lipid and plaque deposition in the arteries, and, and inflammation might make that plaque more vulnerable to rupture. So this is what happens in a heart attack and often in a stroke, is that there may be plaque in the arteries, and it becomes inflamed, and the plaque ruptures, and a clot forms suddenly. Suddenly, and that's what might trigger a heart attack event. You mentioned earlier about complications with pregnancy, diabetes, as well as hypertension. So it sounds like we need to make sure that women are bringing up that issue if that did occur with them so that that's part of their medical record and not being forgotten because perhaps it happened so long ago. Right. Um, Women remember their pregnancies very well. We just have to ask about it. So I was part, as you brought up at the very beginning, part of the 2019 primary prevention guidelines that were put forward by the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology. And so this was designed to be a comprehensive document for clinicians and their patients to really address cardiovascular risks broadly. And so there's lots of recommendations in there related to exercise and diet, as well as blood pressure and cholesterol. But a big piece of it is this risk assessment. So we still recommend in the guidelines that we start with this 10-year risk calculator that includes those traditional factors, you know, age and blood pressure and cholesterol. But we know that that's just a starting point, that estimation of someone's 10-year risk for a heart attack or stroke. That calculation, in some cases, can be overestimated, and in many cases, it can be underestimated. And so what's in these guidelines now is this whole big table of what we're calling risk-enhancing factors, that if these are present, that someone... Maybe they would be considered low risk because of their younger age, but they have these factors, and so it elevates somebody into a higher risk category and has all these things that we've been talking about. It includes autoimmune disease. It includes early menopause. It includes preeclampsia. So it's in there that we should be asking the patients about these history because that will elevate a woman to a higher risk level. That might mean that these women need more intensive lifestyle, further efforts at diet and weight loss and exercise. They might need additional testing to see if they do have atherosclerosis in their arteries. We talked about a test in the guideline called a coronary artery calcium score to look for atherosclerosis in the heart arteries when decision to treat with medications is unclear. And then after we do all this assessment for women that are at elevated risk, that's when we start talking that maybe they need preventive medications such as statins to lower their risk. But we need to first assess women's risk so we can deliver the most appropriate preventive therapy. And in looking at family history, mm-hmm. how much of a factor is if your dad has had a heart attack or your, or your mom or say your brother or your sister, a first degree relative? Yeah, so it's very important. So family history, which wasn't in that risk calculator, is also one of those risk enhancing factors, especially when it happens prematurely. If you have a first degree relative and a mother or father or sibling, you know, before the age of 60, that certainly increases your risk. So that's really important that we take a really good family history. 
And many times just having a strong history may prompt us to initiate preventive medications such as statins, or it may prompt us to do some additional screening, like getting those coronary calcium scores in individuals who don't already are known to have the disease. Uh, women who already have established cardiovascular disease, who've already had a prior heart attack or stroke, then um, they're very high risk for recurrent events, and we already treat them more aggressively to begin with. But what I was talking about was primary prevention, which is people not known to have the disease, but we're trying to figure out who's at risk. Mm -hmm. And the idea with risk assessment is that we want to do the most intensive therapy to those at absolute risk to maximize benefit but minimize harm, meaning that if someone who is lower risk, they may not need statins, they may just lifestyle may be enough. So not everybody needs medications and it's really trying to identify the women that are at greatest risk. And the risk calculators are a starting point, but they're not perfect and that's why we need to consider all these other factors. Who should be using that risk factor calculator? Well, certainly all primary care doctors and cardiologists. And the nice thing is that it's often built now into electronic medical records because it's a calculator. So as long as you have the information, like, you know, all women should have had their risk factor screened. And so it includes things like age, blood pressure, cholesterol, whether they smoke, whether they have diabetes, you know, it looks at total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol. So as long as they've had the data, which r adults should routinely have their risk factors checked, and the women should know their number so they can have this conversation. Often the computer will spit out the number. It calculates a 10-year risk for a heart attack and stroke. And again, this is designed for people who don't already have the disease, because if you have the disease, you're already right. in that high-risk category. <laughs> but again, that's just the start of the conversation. I think some of the concern with some prior guidelines from 2013 is that we made a lot of decisions just based on that calculator number. And the idea, again, is do we want to target the highest-risk people but sometimes that calculator is imperfect, and that's where we consider all these other factors to really get into a shared decision-making with our patients to really individualize care. And we bring forward sort of these spheres between the evidence from clinical trials. We factor in you know, clinical judgment about the patient sitting right in front of us, and we take in patients' preferences and values. And patients have different opinions on how intensive or how aggressive they want to be with with their prevention, and it's important to take that into account. Also, take into account things like cost. What I really liked about these new guidelines is that overarching all the guidelines, you know, we have blood pressure, cholesterol, all these things, but there are several overarching themes. And those were, one of them is having a team-based approach. So it's not just the doctor, but often it's a big team for care, whether it includes nurses and pharmacists and physical therapists and nutritionists and, and maybe psychotherapists. It's all about a team. And the other really important thing is we really emphasize that doctors need to ask about social determinants of health. We can make all these recommendations about healthy lifestyle, but if patients don't have you know, access to healthy food sources, if they right. live in a place that's not safe to exercise, exercise, mm -hmm. if they don't have transportation to their visits or they can't afford their medications, you know, we can make all these recommendations in the world and they're not going to be implemented. Yep. And so we need to meet patients where they're at mm -hmm. and consider these social factors and also understand patients' preferences and values. And see what solutions we could come up with for mm -hmm. some of these barriers. When we think about someone having a heart attack, oftentimes we think about a man having a heart attack having severe chest pain, saying he feels like an elephant is standing on top of his chest. But that's not necessarily how a woman may present also having a heart attack. Can you describe some of those symptoms so we can educate our right. listening audience? So you bring up a really important point. A lot of what we consider sort of classic symptoms of heart attack were derived from older studies of white middle-aged men in Framingham, Massachusetts, and really don't represent sort of the, the, the broad patient population. Both women and men certainly can get chest pain or chest tightness uh, when they're having a heart attack. And so this is something that comes on suddenly and is often very severe. But there also can be non-chest pain presentations, including a tightness squeezing in the jaw, the neck, or the arm. It can be pain in the back. It can be severe indigestion, extreme fatigue, extreme shortness of breath. Patients in setting a heart attack are feeling really unwell. They may have these, these symptoms. It's important to recognize that because when these patients show up in the emergency room to be considering that this could be a heart attack presentation, 
we know there's a certain type of heart attack called an ST elevation myocardial infarction. And this type of heart attack, the artery is completely closed. And so it's an emergency. Every minute counts because we need to get that artery open up as soon as possible to restore blood flow. And we know that women compared to men, there are delays, both on the patient's side and the doctor's side. So studies have shown that women compared to men are more likely to wait at home longer before they seek medical attention, before they call 911 or go to the emergency room. And it's often because of these atypical symptoms, they're attributing it to other causes. They're thinking they're having a panic attack or they're having a severe indigestion bout or a gallbladder attack. And so Mm -hmm. they wait longer to activate care. And so that's part of the education we're doing today. But unfortunately, there's also delays. Even when they come into the emergency department, there's delays between when they come in to when they get up into the cardiac catheterization lab and and get that artery opened, uh, what we call door to balloon time. And we're trying to understand and so we can shorten these, these times and make sure that there is not disparities in care. But unfortunately, uh, although it's narrowing and we're improving by having protocols in place and having awareness, there still is a persistent gap with women having worse outcomes after a heart attack. And this often is due to delays in care. And it's due to the fact that they're actually less likely to get angiography and they're less likely to get preventative therapy compared to men. And that even when they're prescribed these therapies, Women themselves are, compared to men, on average, are less likely to be adherent to them. They're actually less likely to to fill their statin and other medication prescriptions. And um, women are both under-referred for cardiac to cardiac rehab after heart attack. And even if they're referred, they're less likely to attend. It mm. may be because they have other family responsibilities and it, they may feel it's hard to attend to something three times a week. But we know how important cardiac rehab is after a heart attack is a very important intervention and yet women are less likely to be referred for that. So there's mm. definitely gaps and we're trying to narrow them. I can see in, in an emergency room someone coming in with severe nausea that GI will get called rather than cardiology get mm-hmm. called. So they're probably doing the rule out before ruling in and looking at a cardiac issue. And yet a cardiac issue is, as you just said, minutes count. Yeah, the biggest problem actually um, may often be younger women under the age of 50 because people don't, you know, think that's what a heart attack should look like. So most heart attacks in both men and women are due to what's called from atherosclerosis where there's plaque that ruptures and there's a clot and that's sort of the the classic uh, from obstructive disease. But um, women compared to men are more likely to have other unusual types of heart attacks they're more likely to have something called Minoka, which is called myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary arteries, where they have a having having a heart attack by all clinical and biochemical evidence. But when they go for angiography, their their arteries are don't have a blockage in it. It's due from other causes in, in the tiny arteries or due to spasm or some other cause. And furthermore, there is an unusual type of heart attack overall, but it may account for 20, up to 25% of heart attacks in young women. And it's called spontaneous coronary artery dissection, SCAD. And it almost happens exclusively in premenopausal women who really don't have any risk factors. So these are women who don't have high cholesterol, who don't have high blood pressure. So they don't fit the heart attack profile because the cause of their heart attack actually is not from atherosclerosis. They don't have the cholesterol plaque. It's due to a a spontaneous tear, a dissection, where the artery actually is literally tearing. And so it's a real heart attack. The heart's not getting enough blood flow, but it's due to this other cause. And so when they come into the emergency room and they're young and they're premenopause and they have no risk factors, a lot of these women are not recognized for a while of having a heart attack, even set home inappropriately. This is a really serious condition. It's a real heart attack. It's treated a little bit differently. We don't treat it normally with stents, but they definitely need supportive care because it's a real heart attack and it's an emergency and we need to get them through it. So I'm particularly interested in, in seeing these women. I have a number of them that I follow in my clinic who've sought me out because, again, the treatment and the management after the events differently because it's from a different cause. But they, most of them have the same story that it was often not recognized, not clear. They just didn't fit 
the picture of what people expect heart disease to look like. And so Mm -hmm. I think anybody coming to the emergency room with symptoms that are highly suggestive of having a heart attack, and that doesn't always mean chest pain, but these are acute presentations, there needs to be really heightened vigilance to get that EKG, you know, immediately on entry and to be thinking about heart attacks Mm because minutes matter. Mm -hmm. And it's less common, but yes, young women can have heart attacks too. Recently, there's been uh, in the news issues regarding baby aspirin, whether it's helpful or not helpful. Mm-hmm. So this was a focus in our guidelines. So first of all, we don't like to call it baby aspirin anymore because you definitely don't want to give babies aspirin. So we call it low-dose aspirin. <laughs> okay. In secondary prevention, women who've had a heart attack, had a, have had stents or bypass, have had a stroke, the guidelines have not changed. Aspirin still benefits them. So anybody with established heart disease should not stop their aspirin. The issue is in primary prevention where it comes down to risk, so people who haven't had the disease yet. So aspirin may slightly reduce the risk of heart attack, but it increases the risk of bleeding, and actually it may cause more bleeding events than benefit of reducing heart attack. You know, in the older days, it was more benefit, but in now in more modern preventive therapy, when we're using a lot more statins, when we're controlling blood pressure, the benefit of aspirin is really quite tiny and the harm is still there for primary prevention. Most individuals do not need aspirin for primary prevention. This was based on there's three large trials that were published this last year. The Esprit trial, which was in healthy adults over the age of 70, uh, who, again, they don't have heart disease, they're over the age of 70. Not only did aspirin not reduce heart attacks, but it increased the risk of bleeding and increased the risk of death. So in these new guidelines, we said that most you know, adults over the age of 70 should not be taking aspirin. There may be select cases, but most should not be taking it if they don't have disease. Again, it doesn't change for people who do have heart disease. And then anybody at risk for bleeding shouldn't take for aspirin. And then for those 40 to 70, we said that it may be considered in select cases, maybe in some of those women that have those risk factors we talked about, autoimmune disease. I still mm-hmm. use it in women who have atherosclerosis by that calcium scores that show they have plaque in their arteries. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll use it in those women who, if they're not at high risk for bleeding. But people shouldn't just go to their drugstore and take aspirin over the counter because they might be doing more harm than good. And it really requires a conversation to assess their risk and determine if aspirin is right for them. And the same with vitamin D. I, th- I think that people underestimate the risks of just arbitrarily taking things that they can purchase over the counter, right. that it must be okay right. because it's out here. I don't need to give somebody a prescription to pick right. it up and take it up to the desk, and that's not how it just works. Just because something is over <clears throat> the counter or a dietary supplement you can buy on the shelf does not necessarily mean it's safe or without risks. Mm-hmm. And so it's really important that people realize that and not be taking things unnecessarily and discuss everything with their clinician. Do they really need to be taking this? You know, what benefit uh, are they to be gained from it? I love control. I got that from my father. Whatever I can control, I want to. I think sometimes women look at cardiac disease as something for themselves personally they wouldn't have control over. My dad had a heart attack, therefore I'm maybe destined to have a heart attack. There's nothing I can do. But we do know from research studies that by lowering the risk factors, that can provide control. And I believe that the statistic is as high as 80% being able to reduce Mm -hmm. these risks. We want people to eat right, but I'm not sure that they always know what that means. Some people are calorie counters. Some people think, well, if I just eat one meal a day, that's better than eating three meals a day. Can you talk from a nutrition perspective What's a smart nutritional plan? Right. So there's a lot of evidence for the benefits of fruits and vegetables. Diets that are rich in potassium and low in sodium have favorable effects on blood pressure and cardiovascular risk. So getting all those fruits and vegetables in. We know, on the other hand, 
simple refined carbs, the sweetened beverages and the, the breads and the white pastas and, and sugars and, and all the desserts and all of, all of those simple carbs, that dramatically increases people's risk for obesity and for diabetes and creates an insulin resistant state. And so we really encourage uh, reducing all of the simple carbohydrates. But the good carbohydrates that we see in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, there's a lot of evidence for that. And then you know, lean sources of protein. We still recommend reducing uh, saturated fat. It's maybe better to not substitute it for those bad carbs, but more of the polyunsaturated, monounsaturated fats that we see in fish like salmon or olive oil and nuts. And so those seem to be healthier fats to substitute for some of the saturated fats. And then really to avoid at all possible trans fats. So there's a clear harm statement that trans fats are well established to increase cardiovascular risk. And so those are sort of the basic principles. And, you know, people should be, if they're trying to lose weight, be mindful of their total calorie intake and to balance this with a heart healthy lifestyle that includes regular exercise, physical activity, at least 150 minutes a week of moderate to vigorous activity. I think that sometimes people don't take things in stair steps and they try to jump into something like they're going to go and buy a gym membership and they're going to see if they can go to the gym for 90 minutes five days a week and they've never been to a gym before done any exercise before and it kind of falls on its face pretty soon so i think we want to encourage people to do things in steps of first go out and walk around your Mm -hmm. block Mm -hmm. that may be the first step of, of exercise, get your neighbor to go with you, and then next time maybe go two blocks so that they're building up to a regular So the routine. guidelines talk about physical activity, not necessarily exercise. So it's all activity counts. And you get most of your cardiovascular benefit from what we call modern intensity activity. So even this includes just things like brisk walking, which most people can do, moderate housework, yard work, moderate gardening, dancing or yoga. You know, most of your cardiometabolic benefit in terms of your lipids and, and blood pressure are for, are for moderate intensity activity. Now, there may be incremental benefit from doing those more vigorous things like the running or the intensive cycling, and but that can be intimidating for a lot of people. And you can get most of your benefit from just doing the moderate activity. So we can just encourage people to do that. So we recommend at least least 150 minutes of moderate activity or or something more intensive but the the guidelines has in there a statement that even if you can't make that minimum amount that any activity better than none any activity has some benefit there's no lower threshold uh, where you get no gain in fact If you get the most benefit, if you go from being completely sedentary to doing something, there's even more gains uh, than once you get, you know, at these really high levels. Mm -hmm. So I encourage everybody to do something. Uh, We also recommend trying to reduce sedentary behavior, uh, sitting time, and offset that even with light activity like leisurely walking, which falls into light intensity, so not in that modern intensity, but if that's used to replace sitting time. So those were the real principles. We encourage clinicians to ask all their patients about activity, kind of another vital sign so they can counsel them. There's data that the more patients talk to their doctors about their activity level, they're more likely to get active, that they shouldn't feel like they have to do these vigorous exercise, if they can just do modern intensity level, they'll get most of the cardiovascular gain. As we close out this discussion today, I'd like to talk about teenagers. There's a lot of moms out there that are listening to this podcast. And what I've been observing among teens are higher levels of smoking and vaping and e-cigarettes, more sedentary behavior, with their thumbs getting exercised well, playing technology games rather than outside playing baseball or or basketball and such. I also think that they're dealing with a lot of stress that they may not necessarily be discussing, but they're seeing a lot going on now on the television and on social media that we never had before, that we wouldn't even know these things were going on around the world. And now young people are. Can you give some advice to moms as to how to support their particularly teenage children so that as they're growing up and becoming adults, they're not priming themselves for a heart attack? 
So I'm a, an adult cardiologist. So just as a caveat, I don't uh, take care of teenagers in my clinical practice. But that being said, there's an enormous amount of epidemiology evidence that risk factors cluster and they track throughout lifetime, meaning that if you're more likely to be heavier, overweight, and sedentary as a teen- child or a teenager, that th- that tends to lead to adults that have obesity and weight gain and cardiometabolic problems. So the earlier that these risk factors sit in, they tend to track. And so that's why it's really important to try to prevent the risk factors from developing in the first place. And there was new physical activity guidelines were released by the Department of Health and Human Services last November uh, that were published in the journal JAMA. And they do have recommendations for uh, both children and teenagers being active. And, you know, I encourage, uh, you know, I guess it's sort of harder with teenagers, but, you know, for families in general to do family-based approaches to prevention. You know, families that exercise together do fun activities that are getting that heart rate up, whether it be, you know, hiking or doing sports or things together as a family. Eating well, I think there's something really important to kind of model behavior. I mean, teenagers have strong will, but I think the more that parents sort of model behavior, I mean, some of that, there may be some resistance uh, for sure, but some of that will will sink in. And even if it's not when they're a teenager, maybe when they're a young adult, they might remember some of the habits and that they were brought up and getting exposed to being taught about healthy meal choices. So I'm a big fan of encouraging kids and teenagers to cook so they can learn about mm. these practices. You know, <clears throat> give the teenager a night where they're cooking for the family and have to come up with a whole menu and oh make it boy. a challenge where they have to meet the American Heart Association uh-huh. specifications. Great idea. And then, you know, talking, I'm really worried about these e-cigarettes because these teenagers, these are non-smokers that they would not have been smokers. And these e-cigs are supposed to be designed to help adult smokers, you know, quit smoking. To wean off, And right. yet there, there's people who have never been smokers taking them up and becoming addicted to these and they have all these flavors and, and they can be, you know, attractive and mm-hmm. understanding, you know, that there's harms there that we don't fully understand yet appreciate and that they're not safe. They may be safer than traditional cigarettes, but they're not safe and there's no no reason to be using them. And, and I have parents having a discussion. I mean, these are things that, you know, I was never exposed to growing up. And so parents need to be aware of the things that are out there and... It all comes down to trying to, you know, have an open door conversation mm-hmm. and a good relationship. And an ongoing one, an not ongoing just one, one. time. Uh-huh. But yeah, there's enormous stress on our kids these days. Uh, society has changed a lot and expectations have changed a lot and lots of demands in school. It's, it's a very uh, challenging time for, for both is. parents and for teenagers. Yep, sure is. Thank you so much. You've given us a wealth of information today, and, and we certainly do... Uh, do appreciate it. Prevention is what we want to focus on rather than having to go down the path of treatment. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that our listeners have paid close attention to your very specific advice as to how they can reduce risk, what to watch for if they are perhaps experiencing a heart attack, as well as what can they do for their family to keep their family's cardiac health as best as it can be. So thank you so much. Thank you again for having me. Thank you for listening to A Woman's Journey podcast. Join me, Kelly Gear Ripkin, your host, Lily Shockney, and a variety of Johns Hopkins experts on the first Thursday of each month to learn about medical advances in women's health. A Woman's Journey is grateful for the unrestricted educational grants from Biosense Webster, Boston Scientific, and Keswick Wise and Wellness Center that support our podcast series, Insights That Matter. For more information about A Woman's Journey, visit our website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey, and like us on Facebook and Twitter. Until next time, stay well.